Okay. Thank you. All meeting of the City of Nesby Planning and Zoning Commission to order February 15th, 2024. Uh, call the roll. Michael Eblin. Present. David Brown. Here. David Cobb. Present. Douglas Dunn. Excused. Elisa Espiriti. Present. Sandy Huseman. Here. Doug Taylor. Present. And let's see, we have Xavier uh, Rodriguez. Present. And our staff liaison, Emmanuel Stewart. That's me. Here. So we will go, uh, first of all, does anybody have the call? This is a call to the public. If anybody has anything they would like to speak to that is not on the agenda tonight, and uh, now would be the time. I don't know how to get on the agenda. All right. My name is Marilyn Seabold, some of you know me, uh, and I no longer have property within the city limits, but I just wanted to express some concerns, ideas with respect to shipping containers. Um, excuse me, that is, a, that is on the agenda. Oh. So if you'd like to speak during the agenda, oh, oh. call. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. Okay. So I can just go. Over. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Call to the agenda is closed. Call to the public is closed. We'll go with the agenda one. Public hearing on a proposed amendment to the zoning code. Uh, Possible recommendation to the mayor and council, consideration of a proposed amendment to the Zoning Code Article 6, General Provisions, Section 6.5, Outdoor Storage, C, by adding shipping containers <coughs> to the list of prohibited storage. Um, I will declare the public hearing open to receive public comment. And if you'll come up and state your name, uh, there's a three minute uh, time allowance. And uh, call to the public is open. My name is Dr. Jeff Baudouin. I'm speaking to you today as a concerned citizen. I do not own a shipping container, nor do, nor do I have any intention of purchasing one. My interest in this matter stems from my concern for the rights of residents and property owners who live outside of Old Bisbee. It should be noted that I also hold a master's degree in design with an emphasis in sustainability. Shipping containers are constructed with premium steel, engineered under harsh elements, and are fireproof. The average shipping container costs less than half as much per square foot than traditional wood structures. And because they are built with robust steel walls and lockable doors, they offer an exceptional safeguard against burglary and fire damage. Their durability, cost effectiveness, eco-friendliness, fire resistance, and security have made them a favorite selection amongst leading communities around the world searching for an economical and sustainable solution to meet their storage requirements. No states prohibit the use of shipping containers and structures. Recent efforts by small municipalities such as Carthage, North Carolina and Grafton, Wisconsin to ban shipping containers were driven entirely by aesthetics rather than practical function. The FEMA fire index for Cochise County is 97 out of 100. And last night's fire on Main Street underscores the urgent need to consider the fire, the, the safety and well-being of our citizens first and foremost. Aesthetic appeal does not appear to be the motivating factor for most residents living outside of Old Bisbee. According to census.gov, the median income in Bisbee is only 43,000 compared to 73,000 for Arizona which is 41% less than the state average. And 20% of Bisbee residents, residents now live below the poverty line. 
I would suspect many people here are more concerned with getting their basic needs met, affordable housing, and earning a living wage than the aesthetics of a highly functional, affordable, fire-resistant steel container. The history of structures in Bisbee is colored with alternative structures, which still compose the hallmark of the area's unique style. Many of the old mining shacks in the area struck an unmistakable similarity to the trending styles of many of today's modern shipping container structures. Meanwhile, the affordable housing shortage in Bisbee proper is being further exacerbated by local zoning restrictions and economic disparity. Construction21.org, a sustainable think tank and network, states that shipping container structures could be the sustainable answer to climate change as well as the affordable answer to the U.S. housing crisis. In the relentless effort to keep Bisbee locked in a perpetual time capsule, I think it would be wise to also consider that preservation without progress leads to decay, that real people with real needs actually live here, and that the city would greatly benefit from the much needed additional tax revenue that allowing intelligently designed, affordable, and fire-resistant development would generate. Thank you. Seabold, and I no longer have property within the city limits, but I just wanted to express some concerns slash ideas with respect to shipping containers. I'm wondering what precipitated this particular change at this time, especially since shipping containers are being used as homes now. A friend of mine owns and lives in a shipping container home in Tucson, and it's quite attractive. In light of last night's terrible fire, it seems to me that storing things in a shipping container makes much more sense than stor storage sheds made out of wood because they are apparently fireproof and immune from vandalism if locked. When you come right down to it, houses can be classified as a sort of storage building because we're all storing stuff in them. And there are quite a few derelict homes in and around Bisbee's neighborhoods that are way uglier than shipping containers. While riding around Saginaw a few days ago, Jim and I spotted a very attractive small shipping container that was painted with a mural. I heard that building materials were being stored in it and, and that you have already discussed that aspect of, of storing uh, building materials. But a painted container like that would be a great addition to some areas and to the backyards of many homes in different neighborhoods. Also, I have noticed that several people in Warren have built large metal buildings behind their historic homes, and I'm not sure whether they're considered historic in nature, but they were obviously approved by the city. I have no problem with them, but I was just thinking about them when this came up. As I've said before, shipping containers can be made to look very attractive and are being used as housing all over the country. What a better way to recycle something that is no longer being used. In any event, I just don't think that prohibiting shipping containers in residential zones should be painted with one wide brush. I think that in the permitting process, allowing a person to place one on one's property should be taken on a one-to-one -one basis and not be an out-and-out -out prohibition. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Then I will declare the uh, I will declare the public hearing on this matter closed. And I didn't get presentation from staff. So would you like to address this issue? We want to make it real clear that we're still gonna be able to to let these be used as building materials. Um, the shipping containers will be allowed to be built into houses. It's just for outside storage that we're, we're talking about today. Right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner discussion. <coughs> well, <coughs> anybody? Uh, I'll add a couple of comments about shipping containers. Um, I also happen to be a general contractor. I have a background in historic preservation and I sympathize and clearly understand what took place last night. And some of the comments that were passed regarding 
fire safety, et cetera, et cetera. I think one has to understand whether it's a shipping container, a tough shed, it really doesn't matter what it is, so long as it meets all the building code and requirements. I just want to get that out there. So if you're going to use any type of habitable structure, you want to use it for habitability, at a bare minimum, costs aside, they have to meet standard building code. Um, just like historic properties, um, there is some economic discussion to have, you know, if you want to follow the code, historic buildings traditionally cost more money to maintain and preserve than a regular home. In that same vein, a shipping container, depending on how it's designed and how it's used, there is a misconception. In some cases, it can be more expensive to use a shipping container for housing. It's all very subjective. But what isn't subjective is that it has to meet the code. It has to meet all the health and safety regulations, and it also has to meet the zoning regulations, particularly front, rear, and side setbacks. So, just wanted to get that out there, you know, so everyone understands really what's involved with living in a shipping container. There's no problem in it, but you can't circumvent the code and you can't reduce the liability to health and safety concerns. As far as a storage aspect is concerned, most people need to understand if you're going to affix a tough shed or a storage container or any type of storage facility on your property, that also is subject to certain codes. It typically needs to have a foundation. It typically needs to have certain setback regulations. So you can't just drop a container on the ground and say, hey, here you go, or we're going to use this as storage. Um, I have storage containers, they make great uses, but they have to be ground set, they have to be put and designed in a certain way, so again, they don't cause any health and safety concerns. So, I just want to throw that out there, I don't think anyone's opposed to them, it's just the nature that we just can't have haphazardly drop in shipping containers all over the place if they're not meet the, regu the, the regulatory guidelines. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, specific, specifically we're talking about outdoor storage, not affordable housing. And Dr. Jeff, I appreciate that. We're all in agreement that something needs to be happening, and the storage units are a viable option, a viable alternative. But specifically what we're talking about tonight, as I'm reading this, it's about storage. And so, just like having, you know, a big 18-foot RV park right in front of your yard, whomever it is, it's not allowed. What we're talking about here, as I'm reading it, is you can't plop one of those big outside storage things right next to somebody else's house for the use of storage. So, I think your points are being made quite nicely. I was really more worried about the slippery slope. <clears throat> Indeed. And yeah. As long as the slippery slope is addressed, and I don't think, I don't think what we're here discussing has anything to do. Of course, you need to have, you know, the setback and fall within the zone. But we're talking about once they ban a shipping container for one use, I'm worried about the slippery slope for other uses. And there are other yeah. highly functional, affordable, uh, flexible uses for storage containers, and that's. That's, and fire resistant, and that's my yeah. thoughts. And for the record, I totally agree with that. Any other comments? <clears throat> I think they're just appropriate for commercial, not residential. I, I know that um, there were, there, there was a, uh, quite a complaint made when a manufactured home was put on a piece of property. And my concern is if, if a uh, aesthetically pleasing home is put on a piece of property next to someone else's property, um, how are people gonna feel when storage containers are dropped on the property right next door? I, I think that's a real valid concern. Um, well, again, as, as I said earlier, there's what's called lot density requirements as well. 
as Javier, you're well familiar with. If you have a small parcel, you have certain requirements that permit you or restrict you from what you can physically put on there. So I think we also have to look at shipping containers come in 48 foot lengths, they come in 54 lengths, they come in 20 foot lengths. So, you know, if you can put a 20 foot shipping container on your backyard and it meets all the requirements, then there's no big deal. I mean, it, it, it's fine. It's no different from a tough shed. You can buy tough sheds that are 20 by 40 these days and they still consider them to be sheds. But I think the point is that they have to be able to meet all of the regular building requirements. And if they can meet the building requirements, then go ahead, put a container in your backyard. But that isn't what we're voting on today. Right, but I'm just you know, yeah. throwing it out there. We don't actually have to vote today on it, but it yeah. can just be discussion. We do have a regulation that, that limits a shed to 120 square feet. There's no shipping container that's 120 square feet. Um, would, Mr. Rodriguez, would looking at this on a case-by-case -case basis by your department be a better solution for this, do you think, based on if someone has five acres, it's sort of a no-brainer. If they're living chuck a block in Bakerville, it might not be a place to have it. And I certainly think it wouldn't pass DRB in uh, Old Bisbee. Yes, correct. Look at a case by case, I think. Could we, could we put language in that that said, um, and maybe it's just for the shipping containers, or do we change that whole paragraph to be on a case by case basis? I think the, the buses, trailers, campers, and vans was in there because it starts to look like a junkyard if, it, if it's not properly done. Um, that's where we get in trouble, you know, we, we give too much variation on uh, some of these and people use it to their advantage, so I think we need to stick to a yes or no. Okay, because um, that's the trucks and vans was sort of the slippery mm -hmm. slope too. Correct. Right. Any other commissioner comments? Any other staff comments? Yeah. I just have a, a thought here. So I don't believe we have an ordinance if you want to put storage on your lot. There's no permitting or approval process you have to go to. Is that uh, if it's 120 feet or less. Or less. Yeah, it's 100 actually. Is it 100? Yeah, I thought it was a 10 by 10. We, we dropped it down to 100. So all, actually, as of now, all storage uh, storage uh, things you're going to use are going to be permitted, have to be permitted. They're all going to have to have a foundation. They'll have to require uh, everything from the IRC. Okay, so if we, if we have some review process, then it will be a case-by-case, case and we'll address it. You know, each lot's a different size in Bisbee. If you can meet all the setback requirements and get an extra shipping container, be itself, so. Well, that sounds like it's opening up a whole can of worms for you. They're very industrial looking, you know, and I'm not, not fond of them. I know. Well, I love murals and I love all that good stuff, and I'm sure you can make it look really cool, yeah. but it's still the bottom line. It's a big old square box. It stands how tall? 20 feet tall. No, they stand, they're 10 feet tall. 10 feet. No. It's still a big old. Metal box. I don't know. From an aesthetic standpoint, I get why no one. I wouldn't want that across the street. From so Javier, is it an aesthetic yeah. issue or is it a is it a zoning issue? It's a zoning issue too, because it's about the size of most of the lots around here. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter then if it's a it doesn't matter if it's a shipping container or a tough shed. It still has to fall within the zoning guidelines. Mm -hmm. The aesthetic value then becomes diminished and is irrelevant. Correct. So, you know, there are DRB guidelines. <coughs> there are certain historic districts that no matter what you want to put, you still have to adhere to those rules and regulations. So, I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, if you don't want something because you don't like the way it looks, that's really, that becomes very subjective and open to interpretation, and that's not really fair to anyone. Yeah, this was okay. just brought before you guys to vote on, so to get the opinion of other people and that's why we're here.
I'd just like to say that coming right out and saying it's a yes or no issue, I don't think that's a common sense approach to almost any problem. To say it's complete. Do you want to get to no to... containers under any circumstances? Sir, or if like you had a five acre lot. What's that? Would you like to come to the podium? Yeah. Let us know who you are. My name is Kurt Kitchell. I've been here about 15 years. And I drive around a lot. And I see big properties, small properties, when I'm driving down Molson Road or different places. Do you see all kinds of things? And I can understand in small lots with neighbors where the aesthetic issue and all the things that were mentioned, the zoning, the on and on, I can understand that. But a blanket, yes or no, regardless of the size of your property, I don't think that's right. That's it. Sir, so are you, you a resident of Bisbee? Yes. I, 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 Mosin, Mosin Road is in, in Bisbee. No, I know. I'm just saying, is you drive right because a lot of the lots there are like four acres. So when, earlier when it was mentioned that if somebody had a five acre lot, maybe there's an exception there. Mm -hmm. well, so, unless anybody wants to ask me something. <laughs> no, I was just going to ask a question. Just to kind of keep it going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, as I'm understanding it, you can't have a storage unit over 100 square feet. That's already on the books. I think you are allowed to have one bigger than that. But, like I said, there's zoning setbacks to that. But I don't think there's a defined size of your storage. Bin. Like, oh, I misunderstood earlier that. Yeah, anything over 100 square feet is, well, everything's permitted now. That changed. So this one hundred square feet. Yeah. yeah. So they have to meet the the setbacks, and they have to meet the um, what do you call it? Ground cover. Yeah. The, no, it's called lot density. It's called lot density. Well, the lot density it's percent correct. that mm -hmm. we have established. So if the storage units meet all of the requirements, I think then it's. it's so it seems like it's a moot point if. That's, it, you know, 100 square feet, it, if there is a storage unit, I don't know, maybe there's a tiny shipping container that meets that, but then it, but all, all storage units are under review by the building department or planning and zoning for that, at that point. So, to me, this is a non-issue. Now, that's, a, that's where I was going with this. Maybe we already had this covered, and I'm the I'm one that does not want to put more yeah. junk on the books. Yeah. So. So I think if somebody came to you with a, let's say a twenty by literally twenty by ten for the small ones, so two hundred feet, you look at it, look at lot coverage, look at setbacks, and you know it's just like any other. If they wanted to have, I don't know what kind of storage, you would judge it by that. I think this is here to protect the neighbors too. I think there should be some that should be voted on, even brought to you guys and see if that's even allowed or wanted by the neighbors in the neighborhood. Yeah, I don't think that's so bad if you if we're the ones looking at it, kind of like a design review, but for planning and zoning, I, on a case-by-case -case basis, I think, I don't know, I for one am willing to look at them and make a decision based on other issues and the zoning issues. So, I, so um, I think that they could just submit something to you and if it needs to be presented before the planning and zoning, it, it's a no-brainer. So a question I have, as it stands right now, I bring in a storage unit. I'm in San Jose, I'm in Warren, I'm in somewhat dense population. I bring in a storage unit because I'm renovating my building, my home. That's different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's where I'm trying to. So yeah, I can bring that in. Yeah. But however, is this trying to address the concept or the or the uh, restriction on rather than me leaving it there for six months to sit there while I take my good time to build my house and unload that storage unit, or do we? 
What did it cap 30 days on it? Well, yeah, the, the building material storage is, I think, a year, isn't it? Yeah, and it'll be as long as you're left. Open. It'll be okay. a long time. Well, yeah. 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 So uh -huh. Those things all seem to be covered to me. I, yeah, so this seems to me, my opinion, redundant. It's well, I still think, point. I still think that, that um, unless we have a minimum lot size where it would be permitted that uh, we're opening up a can of worms by allowing them. Well, if someone had a, a 6,000 square foot lot with a 1,000 square foot um, home, they'd still have room for probably the largest shipping container. So do we want... If you look, um, at, if you look yes. at 6.8C, trailers, campers, trucks, vans, buses, yep. those are vehicles. The shipping container much like a manufactured home, right. once you remove the axles and once it is ground set, mm -hmm. it is no longer considered a manufactured home and it's no longer considered a mobile home. It's in a fixture. That's just real estate. Okay? So I believe that 6.8C is trying to bring the shipping container into the same concept as a trailer, camper, truck, van, or bus. And, and that to itself is, is, is wrong. It's mm -hmm. not. I agree. Okay. okay. So just on that point alone. Yeah, I agree. The other component is that it doesn't matter if you go buy a steel shed from Sears, from Sears like we used to in the 70s and 80s, which were ugly as hell. Okay. <laughs> you put it on your yard. If it meets the zoning requirements, you're allowed to have it. So I think we're comparing things that are subjective through aesthetic value to what codes are. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. The code allows to have the square footage permissible to put a storage container on your yard. It fits. It's no different from putting a steel shed. Yeah. So go put the container there. If it doesn't meet the code requirements, then you're opening up the door. Because now you're allowing an exception for something that doesn't meet the lot density, doesn't meet the code, doesn't meet the side setbacks. I mean, now you're really going into dangerous waters. So what I'm hearing from the audience, I'm hearing from staff, is that it's an aesthetic value. Well, you, know, you have DRB and historic areas, and you can't put a steel shed because it's not aesthetically meets the guidelines. If you want to go into Warren or San Jose, yes, sir. I think we should define ugly. I, it, uh, <laughs> I, I guess no, no. You make a good point. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could paint your house aqua. pink. Pink. Okay. Now I see so much that I'm like, I can't look at it. Uh, uh, it's understood. Like business. Yeah, that, that's it's correct. Subjective. However, it's sure. if, if, if once you, the fashion police take over, we're all screwed. No, 100% yeah. agree. That's why some people choose not to live in an HOA. Okay, because HOAs have very specific requirements. I hope we're not. We don't turn the whole no. city into an HOA. No, no, and I, I don't think that's the point. So when you're in a historic district such as Old Bisbee. Okay. There are very specific rules and regulations that are governed by Design Review Board okay, because it's a historic neighborhood. You go into a historic neighborhood because you want to preserve those certain attributes. Sometimes colors and certain aesthetic things are in conflict, but for the most part they have to follow certain guidelines. Okay? If Warren or San Jose is not a historic neighborhood, then by default it's not restricted to those rules and regulations. Okay. Here we go. You then fall to the next level where if you want to put a storage shed there and it meets the requirements, it doesn't matter if it's metal, plastic, whatever, it's a storage shed, it can't be, there can't be any prejudice against a shipping container with the caveat that it meets all the requirements. So you're 100% correct. Paint your shipping container fuchsia if you want. Who cares? As long as it doesn't encroach on the rules and regulations set forth in the code. Right. Those two buildings that are going to be replaced at some point or another, that just a tragedy from last night, there's no way that you're going to be stacking six shipping containers. That's a completely, that, that has to <laughs> yeah. Well, you're talking about the, the historic <laughs> well, no, but, but the, the the one's, one's a storage facility yeah. for the purpose of storing one's personal things. The other is out of necessity in order to facilitate a project. That yeah, falls into a different yeah. you know, okay. falls into yeah. different yeah. The okay. intent is that the storage container that's there for the purposes of, of building materials 
is not a permanent fixture and at some point in time is going to be removed. Right. If it doesn't get removed, there's bigger problems because the building wasn't built in a certain amount of time and then when that happens, then you're required to remove any of your products or building materials around the property. That's why you have a limitation with, you have a year to build. Mm -hmm. You can't just dump crap on there and let it sit there in the perpetuity. Even though it does. <laughs> that's, that's an enforcement issue and we, we've battled that before. And I understand. Okay. So do so we make a motion, sir? Would we like to vote on it? Would somebody like to uh, make a motion? I'll make a motion. I, I feel that 6.8C shipping containers need to be removed. Um, so it's not associated with trailers, campers, trucks, vans, and buses. Well, started. it's not on it's there. It's not on there, so we could just remain so the way it is. So you can make a motion. I would make a motion that shipping containers no. are permitted storage use so long as they meet the current code. I will second that. May I get a clarification from staff? Is that going to mean if we approve that shipping containers are an approvable, it still has to go through the same regulations and the same review that you would give any storage ship? Correct. Okay, so, okay, sounds good. Wouldn't it be clear to um, propose the motion that's suggested here and then vote accordingly? Which we would do that too. Which would actually just be doing nothing. Then we would do another, uh, we would. It would have to come back to us. No, it wouldn't because it's not on there. No. Well, we would be. I guess if we, if we did it another it, way, it would have. Yeah. It would be yeah. killing the motion. Sure. But the the motion that Mike gave basically says let's leave storage containers out of paragraph C. Is that my understanding? I don't think it belongs in paragraph C. Yeah. And I, again, I mean, uh, I may not be able to, that one. May not be able to articulate it the right way from a legal perspective, but the concept is. As long as it meets all the requirements and falls within the proper code, whether that means it needs to be ground set, setbacks, et cetera, et cetera, those are not to be negotiated. So if somebody wants to put a, store, a container on your property and it meets the setbacks and the size and everything else. So, Emmanuel, do you have a, an idea of what that motion is that's on the table? I am. <clears throat> the motion that he just made. <laughs> well, I okay, well, you can I, go back and see it on the video. The, the motion that you were proposing is that it be left off, I think. Yeah. But it's not on. Okay. So I think not included. It, it's not included. Yeah, so we can. So I would like to see a vote on what we've been discussing and then a yes or no vote. Well, we do have a motion in play right now. But the motion is to leave it off of the list, and it's not on the list. Do you want to restate your motion, Mike? Because I mean, you interpret point. what I'm saying. You, you guys all understand conceptually what I'm saying. I just can't articulate <laughs> well, the way you guys want it. It wasn't included, so I think if you just change it so that it remains as it is, you, I think that gets the point you need it to read. So I just want to make sure is that what's highlighted in red. Oh. It, that's a that's a suggestion that we can vote on. So right. you could say that paragraph C do not include yeah, right. shipping. Not to include shipping. Okay, I'll make a motion that six point eight C does not include shipping containers. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I would just add that. Well, we're in the we're in the middle of a motion. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, yeah, we can't. Well, I don't know. I'm just trying to be. Yeah, clear. no, it, it's okay. Yeah. But we just have to first get this one out of the way. I second that motion. So your vote is to not include it, but it is not included now. Right. I, I it, still don't understand. I think that's an okay good look at it, you know, because it, it's proposed and we're not going to include it. I think that's okay. Okay. It, it, as a motion, but it doesn't have to pass. Do not approve, it's just the words. Do not approve the addition of shipping containers. Okay, buddy. <laughs> so it was a second to this motion. Yeah, I, I second that. Can I get a clear? You, okay. okay, you clarified motion 6.8C does not include shipping containers in that language. Shall not. Shall not. So, so essentially the motion is not to recommend this language to me. Correct. Yeah. Very good. That's, no, okay. Yeah. Motion is to not recommend language. Okay. 
So okay, Michael Ablin. Oh, did you have another? Question? I think so, because this is a point of order, I suppose, yeah. because you had said that uh, if if we voted on it, then it would come up again, where we can just vote against it by doing the possible motion, proposing the possible motion, voting it down, and then we're done with the issue. I think that would be a much cleaner approach. Okay. Instead of a double negative? I'm not sure how we put Okay, them. so I would like to propose, for the sake of argument, that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend to Mayor and Council a proposed amendment to the Zoning Article 6 General Provisions, Section 6.5 Outdoor Storage C, be, by adding shipping containers to the list of prohibited storage. We have a motion that we have to we have to do something with. Okay, it can and be so withdrawn. I second it. Yeah, we vote on it, and this. Well, okay, be, the I'll second be, that motion. Well, the first motion has to be withdrawn if we're going to have a second. I, I will. I will withdraw <laughs> yes. my motion. Oh. Okay. So you withdraw. You withdraw your motion. Okay. Okay. So I will, we are I will voting on the gotcha. motion to add shipping containers to item C, and I will call the roll. Michael Allen. Yes. You're voting to add shipping containers. No, I want to. No, I'm not. I don't want to ship these containers. It's convoluted. Okay. Yeah. And so. Okay, you withdrew your motion. Yes. Your original motion. That's correct. So the motion on the table now is to add shipping containers to the list of items that cannot be used as outdoor storage. Is the motion right now? Did someone second it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You got me confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I got a lot of people. No, no, no. No, no. Okay, so we're not there. No. No, I'm going to turn this car around. No, I don't want to add it. So your first motion Forget about what I said. was to not add it, and you have withdrawn that. Yes. Okay. The motion on the table was made. Did you make the motion? Uh, sure. Somebody did. Uh, to recommend to the mayor and council a proposed amendment. I think David did. Yeah, David did. Okay. okay, now I understand. By so we're backing it up. shipping okay. containers. To the list of prohibited gotcha. storage. I understand that. Okay. Yeah, okay. You want to okay. call my name again? Okay. <laughs> yes. The answer is no. So right now, Michael this Evan. No. David Brown. No. David Cobb. No. Uh, Douglas Dunn is absent. Alicia Espiriti. No. Sandy Huseman. Yes. Doug Taylor. No. Okay. Motion passed. Well, motion, motion did not pass. <laughs> motion has been voted down. Something happened. Pretty straight. Hey, Sandy, we entertain this one question? I don't want to be rude for Sorry. Do you still have any comments? Oh, okay. I don't think it should be on the list either. So <laughs> 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 so I'm just saying the best way to get it. You gave me what you wanted. Okay. Sandy, okay. thank you for your clarification. You're welcome. We're moving on to agenda item two. Discussion and possible direction to staff to hold a public hearing regarding the proposed strategies for expanding affordable housing options through zoning overlays. Emmanuel? Yeah, it's, that was pretty, pretty wordy and sorry about that. Um, so I was going to make a, I was going to show a um, PowerPoint, but it, essentially the PowerPoint was showing essentially the maps that I included in your packets. Does, it, does everybody have a packet? Okay, good. Um, bye. Uh, so, uh, sorry about all of the technical difficulties. These TVs are not wanting to cooperate, uh, but that's okay. We're going to be getting a new council chamber in a year. Until then, it's just going to be tricky. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to explain. Um, so, if you want to start, um, I guess I'll just start my spiel. So, essentially, we're, you know, our goal is to build affordable housing, specifically for workforce and people that are low income, or just all income levels, really. The plan, the goal is to 
create housing for every income level so that people can find housing so that people with a lot of money aren't moving into housing that is lower cost and driving up that cost because there isn't housing for them specifically. Uh, more housing. So the goal is more housing and to uh, use strategies to create more housing. So uh, we would do this through a zoning overlay. We thought about it. We thought about rezoning these neighborhoods uh, that you see in those maps. But uh, I think that doing a zoning overlay uh, would be um, advent advantageous for us um, because it really doesn't change the zoning, but uh, it allows a kind of an expanding set of regulations. And also it allows kind of a tailored land use and regulations to address the specific needs uh, and concerns of that particular area. Uh, so the advantage of that would be there would be flexibility. Zoning overlays would allow for additional regulations and guidelines. Uh, it, and it, it would enable us to really take a, tailor how we want the place to look, the areas that, we, that I have the overlays. And um, we could also um, essentially start with these locations and expand outward if they're successful. Uh, we can uh, target to regulated regulation and development. Uh, May I ask for clarification? I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you, but of course. I'm looking at the maps while you're yeah. speaking. Mm -hmm. Is are the maps only reflecting in the orange? Is that, or are you having other? Because there's no key, so I can't really. Yeah, tell. I'm sorry about that. So that's no, okay. I just can't tell if you, are you proposing the green. Mm -hmm. you're, that's a proposal. Yes. Yeah, so, and so, the orange is a proposal. Yes. So what I'm proposing is that on the maps, I guess we'll start with there. Uh, I would say that what you can do is you can create where it says green um, and it says green IR which is infill residential overlay zone and what that will do in that green uh, infill overlay zone is it will expand uses uh, and those uses you can see there's a, a, a matrix uh, and you can see it, all the text that's in black is the existing uses and the black X's are the existing allowances in those zones. So you can see it's very limited. For example, anything that's zoned R1 will allow one family zoning, <clears throat> I'm sorry, one family dwelling. Uh, and you can see that in uh, commercial one, it allows one family dwelling, but it doesn't allow anything more than that. In commercial two, it allows a single family dwelling, but no apartment buildings. The only uh, zone where it allows any multifamily housing is an R3, which we don't have a lot of R3 currently. May so, I clarify hmm? again? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a pain in the butt. No, it's good. The cottage cluster would mm -hmm. be more than one home, right? Yep. And that says it's allowed in R1. Cottage cluster. Yeah, it's the bottom down by townhouse. So, um, yeah, I see. Yeah, so I don't know how a cottage cluster would be allowed if we're not allowed to have multiple housing, multiple. Uh, so units. we'll see. We'll see that see once where the red is. The X is red. That would be the allowed use. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay. But what, what I'm saying is that you you just said that with a R three allows more than one residence. R two I think allows mm -hmm. more than one residence also. No, oh, it does. But yes. if the cottage cluster is allowed in R one, mm -hmm. and R one only allows one. Yeah residence mm -hmm. then but you can do a cottage cluster and you can't do the multiple is that my understanding well the, the, the thing is is the red would be what's in the overlay so the overlay would be over the existing r1 proposed proposed overlay. no i understand but what would be the what would be the result of the overlay that's what i need to get my oh answer. okay the result of the overlay would be that these additional uses would be allowed in these overlays that were overlaid over all of these zoning areas. So I'm yeah. sorry, I'm yeah. feeling kind of dense, I guess. No, that's okay. no you're the, helping me. The so the overlay that's over the R1 mm -hmm. says it can be a cluster. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cottage cluster. Yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's verging on the other. Um, so that would be multiple houses, like a one of those Hollywood yeah, it, cottage kind of thing? It, it could be like a little courtyard. So you could have more than one unit in an R1? 
in the overlay zone that's proposed. Yeah, no, I, that's right. No, mm -hmm. I, that, I, yeah, I get that part. So in the proposed overlay, mm -hmm. you could have an R1. So how many units could you have in a cluster of cottages? Um, you know, we're still working that one out. Okay, that's fine. That's yeah. Fine. I just needed to know. Oh, you were. I got it. Okay. So what you're, Doug, I think what you're asking is, mm -hmm. in an overlay zone, mm -hmm. if this overlay zone was approved, mm -hmm. under R1 zoning, currently all the red X's are not They're not used. allowed. Right. Your that question, doesn't... Right. Understood. Your, mm -hmm. your question is that in so much that it was approved, then what is the permitted use or definition of a cottage cluster? Or even the triplex or the, the any of them. Okay. Yeah. I, I can tell you, I don't know if any of you have been to the city of Tucson and watched what Goodman did to the Sam Hughes area and West University with his so-called mini dorms. Hmm. And I think you were on staff in the city of Tucson. He was able to circumvent the code in an overlay district where he created these giant monstrosities that were basically, quote unquote, six bedroom, single family homes that had multiple kitchens. And they were designed basically to what are now mini dorms. And they decimated the historic area of parts of Sam Hughes, parts of Bloodman Elm, and other surrounding areas. And he, he, he was very victorious in the lawsuit against the city. Yeah, that's what I'm And you have to be about. very, very careful with this. Yes, now the, my goal. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Melissa Hartman, I'm also a planner, um, and I'm kind of here to back this up, and I worked a little with Emmanuel a little bit on, on this. Um, the theory where we were coming from on this is to have the, so if we expand, let's say, the affordable housing program that we're doing so well, and one of the considerations is perhaps to do a duplex or a triplex because of the cost efficiency or something like that. Um, so part of this proposal for the expansion of the overlay zones was to be able, and I understand what you're saying, that it needs to be trimmed so that not all of this is allowed was to be able to get the best housing, the right square footage um, that's affordable to the people that want to live there. So we're looking to do more cost effective things in the affordable housing. And in order to do that in an R1 zoning, we needed some expansion. Now how you all treat that expansion is really up to you and I understand where you're coming from. But I, I wanted you to understand where our thought process was for um, doing areas of these um, overlays because those are the areas that most likely we would want to do more affordable housing and entice a developer to do it there. Now the last piece of that is when we do get developers in to do any kind of housing, we work pretty extensively with them. Um, so. But I understand putting more regulations on this, but I did want you to understand the purpose behind some of this is to have the ability to do a little more cost effectively. And I, I think that's an excellent goal. You know I'm on board with that. But what I'm thinking, and I like cottage clusters. I like those Hollywood, you know, like in Chinatown that, where they lived in that little thing. I like that idea. I don't want it to fall into the pitfalls that Mike's talking about, where somebody's you know creating a skyscraper out of a box, and I'm just concerned yeah. because I like the idea of opening up these overlay zones, and I would love to see all of this on that, you know, even a sixplex, but how, you know, what you have to have some teeth that keep people from going crazy. Well, of course. With the overlay, you are you can regulate what people can do. So I am talking. You know, I this is really kind of a bare bones, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically change right here. But what I'm really talking about, and you know, I'm looking to you all for your advice on how we can avoid because you all have been working in this world a lot longer than I have, or at least have been aware of these things. You know, especially you. 
Um, so like my goal is to figure out ways that we can regulate things because my goal is to is to do it so that we can actually regulate it and with the overlay we can uh, we can have more control of the aesthetics was allowed you know if if we have a building inspector and we have to review plans and if they and if they put something out that's six bedrooms with two kitchens on each end I know what you're talking about these things are pretty terrible it's a disappointment to see like this faux Italian eight thing where there used to be like nice little um, you know bungalows in Sam Hughes and in Blenheim Elm and Feldman you know but like um so yeah I mean I definitely I'm not suggesting that we just do a free for all but I'm saying that we've got to really uh, make a make a plan for what we want to allow in in the growth areas are you know San Jose Saginaw places that you know if if you were to ask what you could what you're allowed to build there you could say single family home because it's R1 and that's kind of it. There's not much else in terms of, uh, you know, aesthetics, style, you know, what you can do. You can just kind of throw some stuff together there, and that's what happens. But I think it has to be that a person knows where they stand in the pre-development stage rather mm -hmm. than, because by the time they've spent money on an architect, mm -hmm. and, or you know, presumably, mm -hmm. and have run the plans through the building department and paid the fees and wasted Javi's time, it... They need to know up front, can I do, you know, I just think maybe right. you didn't mean to put X's in all of that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that in some fashion, mm -hmm. especially those, the areas that you have highlighted as orange, I think, mm -hmm. look like they're those strip areas that, that we talked about in the last meeting. I think yep. that's great. Yeah. But I just don't want somebody to think, I'm, I'm going to do a sixplex, go to the trouble of it because it looked like it was mm -hmm. uh, open. Now, if we have something that says it has to be reviewed or whatever, I, you know, I just don't think it should be open beyond the preliminary stage. Uh -huh. Well, you, you have to understand that in the code book, there are permitted uses, but then underneath those permitted uses, there's also certain other guidelines that need to be followed. So, university was a good example what was the highest and best use for a particular property? Well, the highest and best use might have been X, but in order to facilitate that, you needed to have X number of parking spaces. So, university got themselves in a real pickle because if you wanted to build something that was its highest and best use, the parking code said you needed like 1.5 parking spaces, and there were no parking spaces, so by default, if you don't have the parking spaces, then you can't build this product. And that's very similar to what's going on in certain parts of Bisbee. Yeah. So I think the thing to keep in mind is, what is the highest and best use for a parcel or an area, first and foremost? Okay. Is the highest and best use for low-income housing in Old Bisbee, that's your main tourist area? Some would argue no, okay, but others would say, who cares, it's a money maker. And that's where you really got to dive into all the other logistical and code things that are involved. So you can have an overlay district, but that doesn't mean it's a hall pass to do whatever you want. Well, that's sort of what it looked like to me here, is that it is a hall pass. Well, hold, hold on. This is, I interpret this as let's decide on the where, mm -hmm. and we'll talk next meeting or next round on the how. Yeah. Because we have to have a process if we're going to allow these overlays on what regulatory hoops a developer has to jump through to ensure that we have adequate meters for gas, water, yeah. electric, parking spaces, mm -hmm. uh, a review board perhaps, a neighbor outreach, yeah, all of those process. logistics. I think you're, uh, pardon me, I think you're 100% right that, that what, what we're looking for here is recommendations. Some of these things will come off completely. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, I, and I understand where everybody's hesitancy is. One other comment is um, affordable housing and low-income housing are absolutely two different I things. Um, yeah, so I do want to point that out. <laughs> you are correct. Um, and that having the ability to expand it a little bit in an overlay zone gives families more opportunities that live here to build something that they can afford, such as a duplex or a triplex. Now, my understanding of these suggestions, if a sixplex doesn't fit your 
doesn't seem like the right thing in the overlay zone, you yeah. get rid of it. Yeah. You know, um, we're trying to entice more developers here to do quality projects uh, at the best cost we can get. Yeah, I mean, and I and I and I, and I created all these because I figured that you all were going to be right. striking those X's out. You know, with their ideas to think, I think about. Some of them will X themselves out just by the code. Right. Just by default. Well, so anyway, but, but anyway, so. I, just have, I, I would just, my only comment is I, I would urge you to heed caution on this. Yeah. Because developers are very slick and they come armed with a lot of attorneys and they know how to circumvent the code. And you just have to, just for forewarning, you have to be very, very careful. Okay. I agree. You're opening the door and just. Agreed. Caveat on tour is what I can say. <laughs> so I think what maybe what you're saying is that we can talk about it tonight because yeah. I was addressing what I thought was it was on hard paper and oh. you know it was and maybe what we're doing is just discussing and you could refine it based on that. I mean I could cut it down considerably. And, and I'm not actually at, from my standpoint I'm not advocating cutting it down. I'm just advocating that we have a clear path. Mm -hmm. that isn't some mystery thing mm -hmm. that you find out after you've spent, you know, I don't know, $50,000. Sure. No, I mean, I, I think that that's part of the process is figuring out those things to put in place to ensure that that's not happening. Yeah. You know, uh, and such as it is, these overlays, really, I know it's, it looks like it takes a, a significant portion of the map, but really it's only a, it's about a block in from Naco Highway and from and from um, Highway 92, and uh, also, um, you know, so it's not a huge area, but and uh, it's uh, you know, and also can be slimmed down as well. So, so I, as I'm re oh, sorry. as I'm reading this, we're talking about um, direction to staff to hold a public hearing. Yeah, that's all we're talking about. Yeah. So at some point or another, yeah. you'll have kind of a lot of these things somewhat addressed. Yeah. But your intent, the objective is for us tonight to say, yay, have a public hearing or yeah. nay. Yeah, because, you know, you can take this to... And also, I, I, I part of it is, is I'm wanting to hear what your perspective is on what you think the neighborhood would, would say about this. Well, they'll, they'll tell you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they will. <laughs> yeah. But I... I think that your overlay maps mm -hmm. uh, are pretty right on. Yeah. I just want to make sure that, and I'm not even sure some of those should have the R1 along those those routes. There's a lot of commercial and that sort of, yeah. sort of thing. But I would like to see uh, that we sort of massage that. Oh, yeah. And I think you're. I I kind of agree with your your overlay map. Yeah. I'm. You know, I can vote for a yeah. uh, you know, public discussion. That's great. I think too that some of the um, uh, the sizes that you have here mm -hmm. that you've included for the overlay um, on the R zone <coughs> table five point two R zone, mm -hmm. you have a maximum building height of thirty feet. Isn't that two story? That's just two story. That's two story. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm calling for any higher building height. Yeah. I know. So, so that could that could eliminate some of these right off the bat. I would think apartment houses and. Well, no, you, you can have you can have a sixplex that's only one story. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like I, those cottage, you know, because I, I lived in L.A. and there was a six bucks and they were small units and they just were in a horseshoe shape. And, you know, I see a lot of those in Tucson, too, you know, in residential neighborhoods. So, I mean, the, the, the thing that you can do, especially when you're thinking about, you know, maximizing space, you know, and ensuring that it's, it's a really compact and, um, and um, efficient use of land. So Do we know the um, uh, the South Naco Highway uh -huh. looks pretty wide open in mm -hmm. some in the green area, mm -hmm. um, as does the Highway 92. Mm -hmm. What about the Saginaw? How dense is that area? So in Saginaw, there That's are lot sizes. The lot size is like 30, 30, I think uh, roughly 39. 
100 square feet. That's the historic size. Well, anyway, so um, yeah, I was thinking about uh, allowing, you know, perhaps duplexes, triplexes in that area. Yeah, that's a tough square footage. Or, 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 you know, and they, but they could also be smaller. I mean, you have to think about different types of housing for different types of people, senior citizens, uh, people with, you know, one or two kids. Well, to address Melissa's uh, statements, if I may, um, one thing that for um, affordable housing, I think that people overlook is the monetization of the property. Like if somebody can build a triplex, live in one and rent out two, their, their lives change immensely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a way to make affordable housing is if a resident is building rather than a developer. Yeah. Let me ask a question. Yeah. Now, can, can this committee, do they have the ability to refine this list? Yeah. Because I, I think we're missing, I, I'm missing that, that so we have some duplication, we have some things that we think we really aren't going to be appropriate for our area. And so I'm wondering if you could go zoning by zoning and kind of take a look at this list and refine it and knock off what we don't think is going to work so we have at least a starting point. That'd be great. Well, I do think we have a starting point. Yes. I think maybe if this goes to the public and we listen to what the public has to say, that yeah. is more important than seven people saying this is the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep the options open. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because you can tell them. You can, if, if, if you suggest that you have, you know, a skyscraper in a neighborhood, or you could have a triplex, people are going to be like, triplex. I mean, well, I don't I know. Just propose the skyscraper. That's the, that's the developer's <laughs> angle. Made, made, made out of shipping <laughs> containers. Yeah. So. On end. Yeah. But so, I mean, so, because I think that, you know, a couple of things, there's so much flexibility. We could, we could decide to uh, allow some of those uses in, say, Saginaw mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. San Jose. So, and, and also, like, if your lot size is this size, then you can have this. But if it's this small, you can only have this. So if you have a 6,000 square foot yeah. lot, you know? Yeah. So, um, and we may already have some of that because we do have... Um, square footage requirements, lot mm -hmm. coverage, all mm -hmm. that. Maybe that's modified for certain things yeah. in order to, to encourage that, that uh, maybe denser mm -hmm. uh, development. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about a, a, a lot of things, you know, like that people could do. Like, for example, you said somebody could, you know, if they were going to buy build a house, they could put a duplex and they could rent one side out and it would be, it would be, another housing unit in, during the time of housing scarcity and but also it could bring you know the money back into our local economy because the person who's benefiting from that is that person that lives there in Bisbee. Anecdotally I wanted to say that when I was city planner mm -hmm. the ADU concept was I was like oh we're just gonna open it up and have ADUs that's wonderful mm -hmm. and we've what had four <laughs> that's the thing also is, is I think that you could do these things I think that who could take it who could utilize this is uh, people who want to do affordable housing because we can maximize our what, what, what we're allowed to do with our with our land that we have available to us for a project and what we are allowed to do in terms of expanding units. I didn't see that Melody Lane property on your maps. Was it's on there. It's on there. If you, would, if, would you have green or? It's green. Oh, it is green. Okay, that's why I didn't see it. If, if you, because I can't see green. No, I <laughs> can't see green. But, but if you go to South Naco Highway, uh, it's there. So expanding residential uses, and then I have the orange, and the orange is it is kind of a, a light commercial use. I'm still trying to come up with a concept. For that, but 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 I also think that green could have neighborhood um, commercial, and we're talking about like cafe, small you know grocery stores. I I don't want to encourage convenience stores. It's not my favorite thing, but um, you know something that people that live in the neighborhood could walk to, get some groceries, corner grocery that kind of thing, and uh, or neighborhood meeting places, tavern. Um, that's sort of like the goal there too. Because I, you know, I have a very specific goal for, like, uh, how I think that we could help San Jose kind of 
reach its potential, like as far as uses are concerned. Because I think that, it, such as it is, you know, you do have these older uh, single family residential, and then you have kind of a highway strip. You got, you know, you have a, a couple of self storage units, things like that, you know. Uh, and I'd like to see us put more intention. Because, and, and I'm really thinking about the literature I've read, the, the San Jose Charette and the general plan. You know, and you, that's what people say they want in that area. And so I'm really thinking about the, uh, holistically, you know, allowing these different uses, but also regulating it and also, you know, and to, to, the, to the extent which we can, you know, and also um, just, yeah, I guess just reflecting what's been said before, so. Mm -hmm. I have a question on, I'm going to 5-2 again, okay. the R zone regulations. The proposed overlay lot sizes, um, we're reducing lot sizes mm -hmm. by, by quite a bit. Right. So 2,100 square feet. Yeah. And, you know, and, and also that's one of those things where you can um, regulate what you can put in those lot sizes. And, and that, well, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. With that lot size mm -hmm. and, and our setbacks, mm -hmm. Um, and our height, won't that pretty much dictate what goes in there? I mean, it will, but the thing is, though, is it, it, it expands the sort of what you can have. Like, it allows somebody to have, say, if they had a 6,000 square foot lot and they wanted to break it down into, you know, the parts that would fit into that 6,000 square feet. And then they wanted just to put one house on each one, mm -hmm. it would help to. I mean, it would help, I think, in terms of like, say, like if you were a person that wanted to put a couple houses on your land, you owned a lot, and you wanted to rent them out, you could do that. But it has, but they followed the setbacks, and, and the reason I said 2,100 square feet is because that's the minimum lot size for C2 zoning, right? And you can have housing in C2. So in the existing C2s, that is an allowed use, except for in the C2 zoning, they have zero setbacks for the lot lines. So I, I, I was kind of going by precedence of what we kind of allow in some areas already. So I'm thinking about, you know, a couple of different areas. Well, I think you've got a good start. Uh -huh. If, if uh, the board doesn't mind, I'd like to recommend direction to staff to uh, go forward with a public hearing okay. that we really get the input of the citizens. Okay. I, don't know if that's... I just have one question for clarification. Yeah. Um, the overlay lot size, that's applicable to the IR and the MU yeah. overlay? Yeah. So they're the same? Yeah. So the, the MU is going to, you know, I, I, it, I, it would allow uh, maybe some more intense commercial uses. But because, because it, most of the MU is already over, overlaying existing commercial zones anyway, except for some spots along Naco Highway. Where I feel like we could allow more intensity, especially on a lot of the empty barren land along there. But again, you know, and that's tricky, you know, because I'm trying to, I'm following the highways, the, the existing uses, the existing utilities, you know, and trying to just ensure that we can do something in this area and everything else is still going to be just wide open. And the, and the timeline that we're looking at for people to actually start building in these areas, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't foresee. A major building boom, but um, you know, and it could happen over time, and um, you know, and we can continue to upgrade our infrastructure if that you know if it needs to be, as opposed to expanding it out to the other area of Bisbee, in the very west end, where it's just open open desert with no utilities whatsoever. So, I think we should before we open this to the public, mm -hmm. we should have some further discussion internally and define some better boundaries. You open this up to the public, I think it's going to be some steps backwards. Okay. Oh, no, that, I agree with you. I, what I was suggesting was that they go back and massage it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, we, that's what, you know, I, I would suggest that's that we have, staff. have a better understanding with your input and maybe even a committee outside of this to have a further discussion of what we're proposing and discussing because there's a lot of moving parts with an overlay district and there's a lot of other things that you might be opening yourself up to and 
I, I think it's pretty much sure to have the public involved at this point. Yeah. That would be my recommendation. Okay. It's always good to, you know, to hear because you've worked with developers and so you know how they operate and so you know where you zig, they zag, right? So. I would agree. <laughs> yeah. <and Zach. laughs> I think there's definitely some. So I, I would make a recommendation that we revisit this and perhaps form some type of another, maybe a committee, to get other people involved, so we have a more defined understanding of what's going on. But we have to be careful that we can't do much without having an actual meeting. I understand. So but again, conceptually. So what I hear you say is you want to make a motion to add a working group Go ahead. to further discuss <laughs> this and find a little better and yes. present a package to the public? Uh, well, a, a couple things. We could do that. Um, I, um, I don't know, you know, with Open Meeting Law, I can send this information to That's you. That's what I'm afraid of. Uh -huh. I mean, it's going to require some reading. Yeah. You, you can either meet. Or you could read by hook or by crook, you're going to have to just... Well, this isn't a quick process. Let's yeah. go back, you maybe massage it, and come up with an idea of what we can do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe there's an outside steering committee for it. I don't know, you pick four citizens that aren't on this board mm -hmm. and bring it back. But I think you can handle it. So why don't you... We, for the next meeting, we get something with a little more meat on it that we can start to talk to. Okay. You know, because we can't say that there's going to be a sixplex in a in an R1 zone at this point, but yeah. there may be. I mean, and maybe that's what we should have. I don't know. So that sounds like a future agenda suggestion. Yes, I think. Well, I think it's. It could be on the next meeting. It's only a month away, but this isn't something that's going to get solved in the next six months and so you know I think having a few meetings where we discuss it right now we have some stuff that we can look at but it, I don't think we have enough winnowing down of information we have a lot of leeway and I think you need to sort of hold us a little tighter. I, I, I think you know when you're developing an overlay zoning uh, you, you need to define the purpose, which we know what the purpose is. The purpose is to create an area where we hope there will be affordable housing. I mean, that's why we're doing it, is to try to allow affordable housing mm -hmm. in those areas. Uh, then it's to identify the area, and then it's to develop the rules that will apply to that area. So I think I, I like your um, suggestion on you know let's how do we feel about the areas that have been identified as far as we're concerned it will still go to a public meeting, okay right great but yeah. do we like the areas that are identified is that anything we need to discuss further yeah i like that too. that's right okay so let's think about this we're going to send it to a public hearing a public meeting then which which will then get the feedback and then we'll be able to start working on the the house and, and what's of that. I think that's great. Yeah. The thing I'm concerned about is we have an ordinance in the books mm -hmm. for alternative camping sites. I, I forget what it's called. You uh, mean alternative lodging park? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh -huh. It's words. I'm not good with words. Um, we have that on the books. It is so wishy-washy and nothing. It holds you to no standard. It, it has to come before the board and the board would go. So, you know, it, it's a really lousy little piece of code. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see another one that, you know, just is open-ended and we don't mm -hmm. know where we're going. Oh no, I intend to, to be very regimented in what I want to allow and not allow. It's yeah, very important. Do that? Well, no, it's true. I'm not gonna. Sit, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, all right, free for all. Just go ahead and do whatever you want. So, yeah. I mean, I have, I have, you know, concerns because I, because, because I want to do things. My goal is to help people get what they want, live the life they want, but also maintain safety and other, you know, just. Civility. <laughs> no. Do you present anything to the council for discussion? Because 
they're the ones that are going to have to pass it. I'm, I am, I've talked to some people from the council. And maybe that, maybe that individually, if you talk to each one, it's mm -hmm. got their feedback. Yeah. It would help. Okay. But yeah, no, just working. So, so really quickly, can I get, uh, so we have, uh, was there a motion to for a public hearing? Just to, we're anything. giving you a direct. We're just yeah, it would be a direct. Do you want to find out how many people think the overlays that you provided are adequate? I mean, what do you all think? Well, you know what I, I think. I think they are. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good. Okay, I mean, considering it's only a block a in one each direction from the street, generally, and then some are like more. But you know, again, we can also create a gradient starting with more intense uses towards the highways and. Uh, a gradient of less intense uses the further out you get. Well, and so remember many we have existing uh, residents and businesses on these mm -hmm. these now new overlay districts. Mm -hmm. You got to get their buy in. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So then the next time this comes to us, will we be prepared to discuss we could, and then more of the regulations? Yeah, so what I'll do is I will, in order so that you guys don't come in a week before, um, I will work on sending you individually changes, ideas, stuff, and, and I'll try really hard to not inundate you with a ton of stuff. I'm not going to send you a 20-page staff report or anything like last time. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know. Why so. I didn't read it? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes. Can I ask a question uh, of the realtor? Do you think if um, these changes happen in a in an overlay zone that the property cost will go up? Do you think it will increase the cost of the land? It's a hard question. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I I was thinking that if let's say on Naco Road, there's a lot of housing on that one the western side of it. Naco, not Naco Road, Naco Highway. Yeah. It, I'm thinking, worst case scenario is somebody buys three houses, knocks them down, and builds, us, you know, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, a little community. Mm -hmm. It does, that would raise the property value mm -hmm. for that one person. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it would do to the, you know, we, we do need that kind of input. What does it do when you renovate? Mm -hmm. It well, could. But the question was specifically for all land. Right. Oh. Right. So the but the overlay zones, zones have a lot of residential on them. Yeah. Some people's properties will increase in value, and simultaneously, other people's will significantly be reduced. Okay. If you bought a piece of land with the intention of a single-family, five-acre ranch, then next thing you know, through the overlay district, you've got somebody who wants to build 20 affordable housing units. You're gonna be like, that five-acre ranch is no longer worth the value it was. Right. So you got to find the data. I'm sorry. I said I, I I will find the data for that and see what it's doing. That's why well, I said, that is human nature. You have, you have to be very very careful with where because by default when you when you put an overlay, now you the overlay is at the top. Mm -hmm. and now you've allowed all these things that can come into that overlay because under the overlay they are quote unquote a permitted use. Mm -hmm. Then you have to whittle yourself down that okay because of parking because of zoning because of other things but the moment that that becomes part of the overlay now if you can prove that it's a viable use and it meets everything you could conceivably have a high rise in old bisbee and you've got that situation my mountain view uh, yeah. Yeah. i'm just saying but yeah. as an example you've got mm -hmm. an ongoing situation in old bisbee right now mm -hmm where somebody has tried to manipulate the code. And has closed the project. Okay. And, and now you've got a project that's sitting idle, and it's it's doing nothing to help the community. Yeah. So I just, even though Old Bisbee is not on this, I'm just using that as an example. Mm -hmm. So, so if you all have questions, would you send them to Emmanuel or I? So, because I'm, I'm oh, assuming I'm going to be working with him on this since some of this, um, so that we can further refine this grid. Yeah. You know, um, I have one goal, you guys each have a goal, you, you know, so. Um, 
Yeah, I will say real quickly, the cluster homes, we found old photographs of Tombstone Canyon where there were at least two or three sets of them running right along to Tombstone Canyon and they were so lovely. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, that's part of it. I think you included them in the last packet that you did. Mm -hmm. I think we, we used, did. They were yeah, good. used the photograph. Yeah. I, think, I think they can, they can, you know, cluster homes can create, it's like old Bisbee. Everything's pretty tight and packed in there. But it still maintains a level of kind of a, it's kind of got a rural character, kind of a rustic character, yeah. you know. Around the university in Tucson are a yeah. lot of those little clusters, yeah. that are either attached or unattached. Yeah. I think they're lovely, the little yeah. bees and things. I mean, part, part of it too with, with the overlay was I was thinking, you know, we could really shoot for um, kind of maintaining a sort of a Bisbee aesthetic, you know, that's eclectic, but also kind of reflective of a little bit of its history. Uh, you know, so I mean, like, I would not want to have them go, you know, I don't know, a dingbat or something. I mean, I guess it could be okay. But well, the only place you can control that at this point is in Old Bisbee, although yeah. Warren is applying for a historic uh, district. It's a historic right. district, yeah. yeah. That's my project, yeah. And now my understanding is they're not going to have a DRB. No. I don't know if they get the tax break if they don't have. The question of whether or not they have a DRB um, has not been decided. So we've completed, is, is it okay if I talk about yeah. this? So we've completed the surveys because we had to redo everything from the former um, um, consultant because it left a whole lot of things out. So um, we did complete the survey. All that data is being uploaded. Um, this, it, and this is going to become a district. So individual homes are not affected by this um, unless you're you decide to get your own designation on your home but this is a district it's it, it's up like that so it doesn't so you know, we're not going to dictate but it's not held in right yeah. right the drb question has not yet been answered and as this application goes to the keeper um, and he approves it and at that point it'll go back to the neighborhood um, my understanding so far from our consultant is that it, we can have one or not have one. But does that affect your, uh, and I'm sorry, we're, uh, we're, really, we're yeah. way off. Yeah. We're way <laughs> off. <laughs> yes, yeah, and I, yeah, anyway. Any, anything else on agenda item two? Uh, no. Make a motion to dismiss. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Hold on. Any, how about staff comments? Any staff comments? In general, without discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate your I appreciate your guys' input because this this is very difficult. We're trying to achieve some goals. Um, we're also trying trying to um, make sure that the ten year comprehensive plan is update and allows for more ways to build the kinds of homes that Bisbee needs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any future agenda items? We have this. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Fire removal, repair, and or replacement requirements in downtown historic district. I know it just happened last night, but a month from now there's going to be questions and discussions about what the requirements will actually be to fill in those two empty buildings. Well, the requirements will be to make it exactly what it is. That would be the first. Right. And I'm, and just then, putting, I'm just putting on the agenda so that we can talk about right. it next month because I yeah. don't know exactly what the ordinances are and you know what, who's required to do what. So I just want to get that on there. Okay. Okay, Mike. Motion to dismiss. <laughs> <laughs> adjourn. 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 Motion to adjourn. Second. I agree. Thank you, Sandy. Who else? Once these days are going to get out of this, it's going to be daylight. It's going to be daylight. It's going to be daylight. It's going to be daylight.